Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Weight Research Institute webinar. Today, our speaker is Dr. Martin Van Helden, um, and he will be speaking to us about integrated pest management in Russian wheat aphid. Martin has a PhD in plant protection at Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands, and he then worked in French viticulture for almost 20 years before moving to Australia, where he has been working for Saudi since uh, 2016 on Russian wheat aphids and other broadacre pests. Um, a reminder today that you can ask questions at any time throughout the presentation by typing into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, but we'll, we will then uh, ask Martin the questions at the end. Uh, please use the Q&A box, not the chat box too. Um, so over to you, Mart. Oh, I'll also say too that a recording of this webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel and the D Weight Research Institute website after today's webinar. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Karen. Good day, everyone. Um, yeah, today I will present you the work we have been doing on Russian wheat aphid over the last couple of years um, and working towards an IPM approach. Um, Russian wheat aphid was first discovered in Australia in 2016. It probably had arrived already before, but we found it only for the first time in 2016. And this was a, a long-awaited biosecurity risk, um, especially because overseas some reports exist that say that it can do a lot of harm, 86% of yield loss, quite extreme. Um, and in the meantime, this aphid has spread over most of the southern grain belts. And if you have read the news recently, even Western Australia is no longer um, free of Russian wheat aphids. They've been discovered in Esperance a couple of weeks ago and are very likely to spread further over that area. Um, if you look at some Climax data, then they basically can install everywhere there where there's um, cereals being grown in Australia. So the GRDC um, is investing, has invested in this big project, which is called the Russian Wheat Aphid Risk Assessment and Regional Thresholds, which had a couple of simple goals, um, is to determine the regional Russian wheat aphid pressure and to develop regional thresholds for Russian wheat aphid control, for which we have two years available, um, which is impossible, but we did it anyway. So I'll give you the results and you can see if you like it or not. Um, Russian wheat aphid, when it was first discovered, um, increased the amount of seed treatments against this aphid, um, which was usually not very much used in the drier areas. Um, seed treatments using neonicotinoids, which are extremely efficient insecticides. Um, they will protect the plants for quite a long time, probably six to eight weeks, um, against an early infestation with these aphids. They're cheap and they're easy to apply, so they may seem very tempting to a grower, um, but you have to admit that they are not really IPM compatible because they will work whether there's aphids or not, and in many cases there might not be aphids, so that's a um, loss of efficiency and loss of money. Um, if everybody uses them, there will be a risk of resistance selection, especially for green peach aphid, as we already know there is resistance there. And neonicotinoids are also um, accused of having a lot of non-target effects. Um, there's very little research going on in Australia on that, but worldwide there's about one scientific publication a day on off-target effect of neonicotinoids on all kinds of organisms, including aquatic organisms and mammals, um, which makes that nowadays those products are banned in Europe and they're currently even in Australia under an ABVMA revision. I'm not sure what's going to happen there, but it's clearly that these are very efficient pesticides, but they also might have quite a few um, side effects, which we don't like too much. So what have we been doing over the last couple of years? Um, we basically set up very simple trials, small pot trials with replicates in a lot of sites, as you can see in the figure, um, all over the southeastern area of Australia, um, SA, Victoria, New South Wales and even Tasmania, uh, mainly focusing on barley and wheat, which are the only real um, crops that are being attacked by Russian wheat aphid and where damage can occur. 
Um, most in all the sites we had a natural infestation trial, so basically we just waited if aphids came in and then looked at the population dynamics and the possible yield loss. And in 15 of these trial sites, we were also doing an artificial inoculation trial where we basically sprinkled aphids on. There's a couple of different controls. So there's the untreated control where we just let the aphids develop, the C treatment using neonicotinoids, and we also had a treatment where we spread the aphids over growth stage 40 using chlorpyrifos if they were present. Um, and then it's a matter of basically doing observations, counting aphids, counting symptoms, uh, which is a long and tedious job. Well, luckily, we had a lot of contractors doing that for us. Um, and at the end, of course, we harvest and we look at the yield quality and quantity of all those trials. Relatively simple, but very time consuming activity. Um, here we've got the results. If you look at the yields of the different trial sites, as you can see, we have different sites and different years, 2018, 2019. And here we've got the observed yield in tons per hectare. So as you will understand, uh, the main yield effect is actually the region. Uh, secondary effect is the year. There's a bit of effect of the serial type and variety. And at the end, is there something that is actually rushing in for damage? That's not that clear. So we need to look into that much closer. Uh, as an illustration on the photo, you can see a trial site in Riverton 2018 with uh, non-inoculated and an inoculated plot side by side. Um, I have to admit, I don't remember which one's which, and I can't see the difference on the photo either. So maybe not that impressive as an effect of Russia with aphids, in spite of the fact that one of these two plots was inoculated with aphids. So what did we see in all these trials? Well, first of all, 28 non-infested, non-inoculated trials, natural infestation trials. We never ever saw high population of Russian weed aphid. We never ever saw yield loss. So it's very clearly that in 2018 and 2019, Russian weed aphid was not a problem. So if you would have relied solely on these trials, we would have had zero results. So luckily we were able to do artificial inoculation trials. Uh, where we basically sprinkle aphids on. So we've been driving around to all those inoculated trial sites with cages full of aphids. And, uh, we sprinkled aphids on about 50 aphids per square meter, half a million per hectare if you want, at very early growth stage because that's where the aphids normally come in. Um, and in some cases, as you can see in the graph, we reached high numbers of aphids um, and also yield loss. So as you can see, it's not in all situations. We have a very impressive aphid dynamic here in Griffith. Um, but for example, um, this one here at the bottom, which is um, Cressy, I think, uh, last year, the aphids hardly build up to any level. So there wasn't many aphids. Tasmania, anyway, seems to be a bit too wet for Russian meat aphids. Um, so we had to look for yield loss due to Russian wheat aphids. Um, and because the yield is so variable, we can't really look into actual tons per hectare that we lose. We need to look into something that is relative to a relative number of aphids. Um, and we looked at what was the best factor that we could use to explain yield loss. And as you can see in this table, uh, on number one came out the percentage of tillers with aphids. Not very surprising but clearly better than the percentage of tillers with symptoms or the actual numbers of aphids per tiller or the total number of aphid days spent on the plant. The percentage of tillers with Russian wheat aphids gave the best correlation with yield loss. Um, if we then take all the data and look at that, uh, out comes a very simple formula, which is the percentage of yield loss is 0.28 times the percentage of tillers with Russian wheat aphids. Extremely simple extremely easy to apply um, and it covers automatically regional differences and year effects. Um, well, you have to think about what is the potential yield to estimate the actual yield loss that you will get, of course. Um, it applies to all cereal types that we've used in the trial, barley wheat and durum wheat. And it's relatively easy to observe because you don't have to count all the aphids, you just have to count the number of tillers with Russian wheat aphids. Um, a similar threshold was developed in the United States, and they found a 0.45 percentage um, yield loss per percent of tillers with Russian wheat aphid. So that's already quite clear. Um, the Russian wheat aphid has less of an impact on yield here in Australia compared to the United States. Um, 
So now that we know the percentage of yield loss, we can actually establish uh, what's called the economic injury level. Um, based on that formula, if the economic injury level by definition is when the yield loss is more than the cost of control. So you should have controlled the aphids to avoid yield loss. It's an economic activity. Uh, and you can calculate that quite easily if you've got the right parameters to enter, which means you need to have an idea about the expected yield, which farmers generally have. You need to have an idea about the farm gate value of the yield. Let's be optimistic and say that that's the current price and that it will go up or down, whatever. Um, and you need to know what your control costs are. If you have those values, then you can actually determine the economic injury level due to Russian wheat aphids. Calculation is then simply putting all that in your formula. And as an example, I used a two ton per hectare crop uh, at $250 per ton farm gate value of the uh, cereal, $20 per hectare pesticide cost or pesticide application cost, I should say. And that would give you a value of 14% of tillers with Russian wheat aphids before you should actually apply the pesticide um, because it would be uh, economically to do so. In the second example, which is in the, in the lower part of the slide, you can see that at a higher expected yield, eight tons per hectare, a higher price of the cereals and even higher cost of the pesticide application, um, you would actually get a much lower threshold and that's, that's normal because yeah, you would lose more value, more quality of yield, so more value uh, in those high value crop, high yielding crops um, than in a two ton per hectare crop. So basically in a high yielding environment, you probably can accept less aphids than in a low yielding environment. Of course, it's nice to have an economic injury level, which you want to avoid reaching actually. So you need to have a moment, a strategy to actually observe and decide on whether or not you will have to apply a pesticide to avoid going over that economic injury level. So that's what's normally called the intervention threshold or action threshold or economic threshold. There's a bit of confusion about that terminology. It doesn't really matter. That's basically the decision needs to be taken whether or not the spray needs to be applied. Um, and uh, we have come up with a uh, proposal, which is a observation of the percentage of tillers with Russian wheat aphids at growth stage 30. We don't do that before growth stage 30 because between growth stage 20 and 30, there's a huge quantity of tillering going on, so you get more tillers. You basically get a bit of a dilution effect. And if you look in the figure here, figure three, on this area, which is growth stage between 10 and 30, you can see that this is a bit erratic. Um, due to several reasons. First of all, these are inoculated trials, so we sprinkle aphids on somewhere in this time. But then also there's all these tillers coming up, especially in the high yielding crops. You get a lot of tillers in a low yielding crop. You get less tillers. So we propose to actually wait until growth stage 30 before doing an observation and then maybe do a spray application. From these data, you can also see that the highest number of Russian wheat aphids is usually reached somewhere between growth stage 40 and 50. So we're basing ourselves on, on a predicted increase between the observation and that growth stage 50. Um, if you look at all the data that we have, then we can see that roughly there's a doubling time of about five weeks in the percentage of tillers with Russian wheat aphids. So that can be applied as a rule of thumb. Um, and then all you need to know, well, it's actually not that easy, but what you should know is basically how long will it take to get to growth stage 50, which in the warmer areas is something like 35 to 40 days. In the very cool areas uh, would be up to 70 days. If you would be selling a winter cereal, it might be much, much longer than that. But anyway, um, the rule of thumb is probably good enough for that. And the increase in Russian wheat areas that we've seen in our trials is probably a, a worst case scenario because the trial conditions were pretty good. We didn't have any big rainfalls or uh, storms or whatever. <clears throat> so we think that this is pretty much a worst case scenario for the farmer in these conditions during the last two years. The growth of the Russian wheat aphids in those plots was probably optimal for the Russian wheat aphids. So with all these data, we can actually calculate whether or not a spray should be applied based on the spraying cost, the 
value of the crop, the expected yields, in this case, the days before growth stage 50, estimated at 40 days for this specific situation, and then doing an observation, a single observation of growth stage 30, which in this case has given 4% of tillers with Russian Unilever. If you do all that, the program will immediately calculate this graph for you. Um, and it shows basically a green area, as long as you stay below or in the green area, um, you're okay. You don't need to apply a control measurement. If you are above that, you might have to apply it. So in this specific example, which is the same as the formula from the previous slide, you can see that the threshold is somewhere 14%. You can also see that at the moment we have this 4% of aphids. We expect them to increase to something like 9%, but you will still be under the um, intervention threshold. So the advice here would be to not do a spray to the farm. Second example, oh sorry, yeah, we do indicate the return on investment because you probably want to think of it first before you actually spend money on control to see if it's really uh, a good choice, economic choice to do. Um, second example is the other formula which I showed on the previous slide. So we are talking about $30 per hectare control cost, 300 tons, $300 a ton, eight tons per hectare, same amount of days, same percentage of tillers. And you can see that in this case, uh, we are expected to go over that actual threshold and quite significantly. So from $4, sorry, 4% 4 of tillers with Russian millions, we will probably go over and reach something like 8%, um, which then would justify a treatment. Return on investment of this pesticide application would be 1.68 dollars per dollar invested. The calculator is available on the GRDC Russian Media David site, so everybody can use that. And I hope that the growers will use that from now on. One of the interesting things we discussed a lot about with um, well, the researchers, but also agronomists and farmers is, is what's actually the cost of control. And, and you always come across that, and that's actually a bit complicated because there is, of course, direct costs, which are well, for a grower, usually it's just a pesticide, um, which is wrong because there's a lot more that needs to be spent on the spray. The spraying equipment, a, a normal modern sprayer nowadays will cost you something like four or five hundred thousand dollars. So that's quite an investment. Um, the man on the man on the person on the, on the sprayer, the fuel, the protective equipment, and even if you drive through a paddock to do a spray, with the wheels you will crush the crop, part of the crop, which is estimated at three percent. So it's not just pesticide cost. You need to think about the application cost. And what we usually say is that you probably need to add 15 to $20 of actual application cost, which is what a contractor would normally charge to a farmer. So that's a, a reasonable estimate of real application cost plus the pesticide, which then adds up often to about $20 a hectare minimum, can be much more for more expensive pesticides. Of course, there's also indirect cost that farmers are aware of, uh, but which are impossible to quantify reliably, is what's the risk of creating an instance, what's the effect on beneficials, what's the effect on the environment, and, and does that actually count for a grower, um, and the health of the operator, which is always a risk if you apply pesticides. So be aware of that, and, and I think there's a, an awareness growing on all these elements, but they're impossible to quantify. So that's basically the new IPM approach. Um, the second half of this project and of my presentation will be on what's actually happening over the summer for Russian wheat aphid. How does it survive the summer when there's no crops in the field and it has to hang on on something? Uh, well, what we see here in this um, graphic done by Ilya Pertl from Caesar is that, yeah, they will have to survive on grasses. Which grasses? How many? Where? and they will have to then migrate into the crops when the crops are emerging, if the conditions are good for that migration. So what we've been doing is that we've been sampling grasses in sun. So relatively simple approach, drive around, stop mainly on roadsides or in paddocks, if there's a bit of green in the paddock, um, either do a vacuum sampling, as you can see Tom Heddle doing here, or do what we call a release extraction. We basically in this cylinder, there's a little globe eating it up. Uh, aphids will go down and are gently collected here in a vial containing ethanol. We can see if there's Russian wheat aphids or other aphids or whatever. Um, and we've collected 
all those samples we've done in South Australia, we've done part of this northern sampling during a specific tour. The rest of it is mostly uh, Caesar that has done the sampling. Um, it's a bit of work, but it gives some nice information on where aphids are present, as you can see on this specific graph, which is present on the Russian beta aphid portal. Um, you can see that Russian beta aphid have not been recorded here in the northern part of New South Wales or in Queensland, but it's likely that they will get there at some stage. You can also see that basically everywhere else they are present. Of course, if we don't find an aphid at a certain spot, that doesn't mean that the aphid is not there. We might not have looked well enough. We should maybe have sampled more grasses. So there's a lot of false negatives, I would say. Um, but all the positive samples also give us quite some good information. So I'll give you the result of what we've been doing. In the next slide, an example of a sample on the left side, and here come our grass species. So if you're quick enough, you can record exactly what we've been doing. But yeah, there's a lot of grasses in Australia. I don't like grass taxonomy, but I had to do it. Luckily, um, people from the state herbarium were a huge help and helped us to identify those 2,285 samples that belong to at least 126 species, of which a little less than half of them were natives. The rest of them were introduced species, and some of them we didn't know, so 70 plus 51 is only 121, as you might have noticed. And in these samples, we found 286 positive samples. So that's quite a significant amount. It's more than 10% of all the samples from 54 grass species with a lot of false negatives, as I said, 17 native species. None of them had never been recorded as being host for Russian wheat aphids. If you're smart enough, then you see that there's probably eight of those grasses that are present elsewhere, because of course, none has been recorded in Australia before. So these must have been at least eight species from Australia that have been introduced elsewhere and are hosts for Russian wheat aphids. Um, we also have 35 introduced grass species on which, of which seven are new records on which we found Russian wheat aphids. If you look a bit more critical, then only 24 grass species, so it's roughly 20%, um, showed at some stage more than 10 Russian wheat aphids in a single sample. And I presume that's showing that they are a real host in which the aphid can actually live and reproduce. Whereas a lot of the other samples might be just one or two aphids, which might have been there a little bit by accident, landing there, hanging on, but not really building up. If we look at the evolution of those samples over time, so here we have October 2018 till May 2020, when we stopped our recordings, you can see that, um, especially in October 2018, there was a huge amount of grasses that had aphids on them, and even the number of aphids on them were quite high. And then it just decreases over the summer and becomes very low, in March, April, but not zero. Um, and in 2019 spring, um, the aphid numbers were much lower than the previous year, but still they are there. Um, and it then decreases again to very low numbers in February, March, April, so just before summer. This summer green bridge, it seems to be a real bottleneck for Russian media. So if you look at all the grasses and see which grasses most often recorded Russian wheat aphids, you can see that barley grass is by far the preferred host for Russian wheat aphid. It's even a much better host than the cereals. So barley grass is the main source of Russian wheat aphids. Some of the brome species, including things like prairie grass, uh, rye grass, wild oats, they're all potential hosts for Russian wheat aphid, but not as big as barley grass. However, all these grasses are actually not actively growing over summer. So over summer, there's very few hosts for Russian wheat aphid. What we found is that one of these native species called the Neopogon microgans, or bottle washers, um, is actually an important summer host. It doesn't have really high numbers, but it is so present everywhere on the roadside, especially in the drier country, that we collected a lot of samples and that yielded a lot of positive samples. So as far as positive samples, in summer, any abogan is clearly the main host that allows Russian wheat aphids to hang on and continue to build up if the rains come. The big question is, yeah, how does that actually react to possible rains? And, and we've tried some um, simulation, some modeling on that, um, effort done by um, James Maynard from Caesar, 
Um, yeah, there, there seems to be differences between years. The effects are not that clear. Um, at the moment, I'm not very confident that we can actually predict reliable, in a reliable way, what the risk is for aphids showing up in, well, maybe the next season. We're heading for apparently a somewhat wetter season. Will that increase Russian wheat aphids to high numbers next year? We don't know. Take home message from all this. Well, first of all, we've achieved our project goals, which is maybe better than could reasonably be expected. I'm pretty happy of the effort that we've done together with CSAM. Um, what is very clear is that we have Russian wheat aphid, but that doesn't automatically mean that we have economic yield loss. The yield impact is not that high compared to other areas. Um, what we do see is that it's most of the impact and the highest populations are usually observed in the low rainfall areas, probably by a combination of maybe a bit more oversummering in the case of a wet summer, um, and also all those low rainfall crops, low yielding crops, there's much less tillering, so there's much less biomass. So the same amount of aphids at the start can actually do a, have a higher impact later on in the season, simply because it's not being diluted in a big crop. However, the big advantage of Russian wheat aphid is that they're easy to spot. You can see the symptoms, they're nice and clear. You can spot them from 10 meters away, easy to detect. Um, we know now that it's probably not a big problem in most years. It hasn't been a problem over the last four years. Um, 2016, it was maybe a bit of a problem, but even there, there wasn't always yield loss recorded. Um, we know that it needs to come in into the crop early in early growth stages, two to four leaf stage, in order to be able to settle over winter and then start to build up in spring. And the actual damage is occurring if it is still there between growth stage 40 and 70. So we basically have a long time during which we can react and we can get the aphids off. So I think the overall conclusion is that seed treatments on every cereal sown everywhere are, are not justified for Russian wheat. There's no need for that. Um, it can be managed very easily through a threshold-based management. Um, and it's, it, it'll be more economic and there'll be other advantage, of course, for the environment and the use of those pesticides. Certainly not finished with Russian wheat aphids. I think there's still more work to be done, especially on quantifying the green bridge, um, but also on what is the effect of a important early infestation? How does that translate to later on? That's something we, we don't really quantify in this project and that should in fact be looked into. The Russian wheat aphids project is finished, so we'll have to see if there's any other research coming up. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Um, does, does anybody have any questions for Martin about his presentation? Just type them in the Q&A box or you could lower your hand and I'll see that. Uh, we don't have any at the moment. So if, if that's the case, we will finish the webinar there and I'm sure Martin's happy to answer any questions you may have if you want to um, contact him privately. Um, as I mentioned, oh, hang on, there may be one coming through now. Yeah, Mike Keller has a question for you, Martin. What factors can be considered to improve the oversummering predictions? Ah, um, that's a really good question because it's not that easy. It's, it's, it probably um, will be linked to the actual grass populations that are growing. Uh, and we probably need to get more data on um, how long there should be favorable conditions for the aphid. Uh, they won't be building up in, in a week after a big rainfall or something. Uh, they might need something like a month or two months in an area of rainfall and grass is growing before they can build up to higher levels that might then infest the crops. Saying that, they still need to migrate and, and migration measurement of migration is probably a key factor that would help a lot for the growers to get a better idea of what should we do risk. Okay, great. Thanks, Martin. Um, another question. Uh, did you make any observations of natural enemies during this study? And was there any evidence that they have a significant impact on Russian wheat aphid? 
Um, yes, we did quite a bit of liberation, especially Tom Heddle has been looking into the natural enemies of Russian relay efforts, um, but also during the Green Bridge surveys, we've been looking into natural enemies. Uh, there's plenty of generalist um, predators and parasitoids of aphids that do have, that do use Russian weed aphid as a, as a prey or a host. Um, in a crop, they will be present only if there's a, a reasonable amount of aphids, <laughs> which is maybe not what the growers want. Um, it would be really interesting to know how much impact they would have on the green bridge to regulate maybe that whole summer in population. And that's where we are really lacking information. But yeah, there's plenty of natural enemies around and they probably contribute to the control. Whether that's enough in a crop that's heavily infested is another question. Okay, another question. Out of 24 grass species with greater than 10 Russian wheat aphid in a single sample, how many grass species are native? Um, I would have to check that in my data file, but I think there's very few of the native grasses actually. Um, it's mostly introduced species that are good host for Russian wheat aphids. Okay, thanks. And just a comment from Mike. From Mike Keller, great work. I especially applaud your work on thresholds. So some good feedback there. Um, okay, so I think we'll leave it there. As I said at the start, we will have uh, the recording of this webinar available on our website, uh, hopefully later today. Um, so that, that would be great. And I'll invite you to register for our next webinar. Um, we'll have a break next Thursday. So the next one won't be till Thursday, the 29th of October, again at 11 o'clock. And we'll have Dr. Haipei Lu presenting on multi-omics analysis of small RNA. Transcriptome and degradome sequencing reveals that the water deficit and heat stress response network in durum wheat. So we'll look forward to that one. Thanks again for attending today.